I have thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed the good singing this morning by the choir. Was that not two great songs? I tell you what, some of you get a little bit excited out there. Over here and over here and in the choir and over there and over there. And uh, that's what coming to church is all about is worshiping the Lord. Amen. Now, I'm going to tell you something. Whenever the Lord's in the midst and the Spirit of God has liberty to move, you do not have to work it up. That's what's wrong with a lot of the modern day churches. They try to, they try to work up a spirit without the presence of the Holy Spirit. That's why you have the rock and roll bands and the upbeat and all that. They want folks to feel like, you know, well, you know, we'll, we're going to get you involved in it and uh, make you think it's the Lord. But if the Lord's in it, it it'll, 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 all, it'll all be just exactly what he orders. I mentioned last Sunday morning what I'd be preaching today, and then again Wednesday night I mentioned it. And uh, I want to preach this morning on this thought or this subject. Listen very carefully. Learning, key word now, learning to deal with the decisions of others. Not your decisions, but the decisions of others, okay? Learning to deal with the decisions of others. Take your Bibles and turn to the book of First Samuel chapter 18, 1 Samuel chapter 18, and uh, this is, uh, I, I chose this particular text because of the life of David, and uh, my, was there ever such a man that had to deal with the decisions of others, David is one of them. Here in chapter 18, I'm going to read uh, uh, a few verses, and notice a phrase that's used in here. In chapter 18, it says, and it came to pass... When he had made an end, verse 1, he had made a speaking, uh, a, the end of speaking unto Saul, and the soul of Jonathan was knit with the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. Now notice verse 2. And Saul, now this is the king, took him, took David that day, and would let him go no more home to his father's house. That means that King Saul took David into his own house. He decided to do that. Do you understand? Then Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. And drop down to verse 5. And David went out with uh, whithersoever Saul sent him and behaved himself wisely. That's a good statement, behaved himself wisely. And Saul set him over the men of war and he was accepted in the sight of all the people and also in the sight of Saul's servants. Now stop and look at me. Here's David. He's still a young man. Goliath has been defeated and now he has found favor in the eyes of the king. I mean, he is, ele he is elevated. He is over the entire army. Okay? Not only is he living in the palace with the king, he is, he is in close friendship with Jonathan, his best friend, the son of the king. Every, all this is made possible because the king decided to do this. It was his decision. But the Bible says here that David behaved himself wisely. In his promotion, his elevation, he did wisely. Then notice verse 6. We don't know how much time passed by. It says, and it came to pass. It came to pass as they came, when David was returned from the slaughter of the Philistines, that the women came out of the cities of Israel singing and dancing to meet King Saul with uh, tabrets and with joy and with instruments of music. And when the women answered one another as they played and said, Saul hath slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. And Saul, was very wroth, at, and the saying displeased him. Now he's mad. It displeased him, and he said, They have ascribed unto David ten thousands, and to, and to me they have ascribed but thousands, and what can he have more but the kingdom? Verse 9, And Saul eyed David from that day forward. Verse 10, It came to pass. And, uh, Look over in verse 14. 
And David behaved himself wisely in all his ways, and the Lord was with him. Verse 15, Wherefore, when Saul saw that he behaved himself very wisely, he was afraid of him. Now, uh, take your Bibles and turn with me over to the book of the Psalms, Psalm 35. Please get there as quick as you can, Psalm 35. Notice all this decision-making going on. Now, this psalm was written by David in this time of his life with King Saul. Now we read there in chapter 18, verse 5, 14, 15, and verse 30 that David behaved himself wisely. The word behave, it's a key word. The word behaved, all right? Now David is writing this psalm looking back. Verse 14, Psalm 35, 14. He said, I I behaved myself as though he had been my friend or brother. I bowed down heavily as one that mourneth for his mother. I behaved myself as though. He be, he, David talked about how he behaved himself. And then uh, uh, over in, well, I won't read it anymore, okay? But in Psalm 131, verse 2, David said the same thing again, how he behaved himself wisely. Now that word behaved, is a great word. Here's what it means. It says it's an act with wisdom. When David beheld himself wisely in those situations, he did that with wisdom. It means with discernment and knowledge. So when David, when the king decided to elevate David, David, David behaved himself wisely when he was elevated. Now, David didn't elevate himself. He was elevated by the king. Now, and it came to pass, and it came to pass, after two or three times it came to pass, we now find that David has become the enemy. In other words, now David has become a jealous object of the king. The king has now decided, I want him dead. He first decided, I want him in my house. I want him to live in the palace with me. I will give him the entire army. Now, that same king has decided, I want him dead. I don't care who does it. Now, David has to, so he had to deal with success and, and applause and advancement. Now, he's got to deal with a death warrant on his chest. And three times in David's life, with King Saul, David could have had the king put to death. And all three times, he said, I'll not lift my hand against God's anointing. He decided that. Living, learning how to deal with the decisions of others. Think about this now. Other people's decisions have much to do with our everyday living. Not your decisions. This is not about your decisions. This is about other people's decisions and how you deal with them. How do you deal with that? I mean, it, it involves you. Sometimes one person could decide, I'm not going to go to work today, and you may work with that person, and all the work falls on you. How do you handle that? How do you handle that? And so uh, other people's decisions have much to do with everyday living. How about this? Children have to live with the decisions of their parents. Amen? And I'll be honest with you. Hey, we've got, I hate to use the word stupid, we got some ignorant parents today. And we have, we're having kids having to deal with the decisions of ignorant parents who have put no thought in their decision making. None whatsoever. None whatsoever. Uh, parents sometimes have to deal with the decisions of their children. Now, I'm not talking about a 7-year-old or a 10-year-old or even a 15-year-old. I'm talking about children who are now 25, 30, 40 years old. Huh? Having to deal with the decisions of supposedly adult children, parents now have to deal with their decisions. How, how are you going to react when your child, who is an adult now, makes a decision and it affects you, how are you going to deal with that? Whether you like it or don't like it, okay? you got to learn to deal with it. Our decisions will affect other people. Our decisions will. Be careful how you make decisions. Why? It's going to affect folks all around you. It really will. Listen. Uh, 
I, 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 matter of fact, if I called this pastor's name, you would know. You might not know him personally, but you would recognize his name. Uh, oh, some years ago, probably five, six, seven years ago, this pastor had uh, worked his way up. I say worked his way through the uh, advancement ages. He went to Bible college and got his degree and served as a youth director and served as an associate pastor, assistant pastor, music director. I mean, had and then finally. Uh, he was able to become the pastor of a very, I would consider a very large church up in, up in a, a neighboring state, okay? I mean, this pastor, and I thought, boy, I was glad for him. I mean, I was exciting for him. He had a wife and four children. And I thought, here's a, here's a, a friend of mine, uh, maybe 10 years younger than me, uh, somewhere like that, I don't know exactly, but younger than me, but still up, uh, up in years, and finally had become the pastor and I thought boy he's being rewarded for all his years of supporting other preachers has a it's, it's probably four or five six hundred church membership large choir large youth choir large Christian school full time full time staff church secretary school secretary I mean just a booming I mean I was excited for it I called him I said praise God I'm glad for you and all I mean and everything he was there probably I don't know maybe three years and then out of nowhere he decides that he'll run off with his own personal secretary and leave his wife and four kids he decided that And, the, and his secretary is married and got a little baby too. So she decides to leave her husband, her little baby, and go off with the preacher. Now, you say, preacher, that's horrible. Well, it's horrible no matter who it happens to. Preacher, anybody. And they've been married, they've been married over 25 years with four kids. Now listen, his, his decision affected his, his, his wife, his children, that whole church. It, that church went from here to here, bam, because of his decision. How, how I, and of course, I don't know, I wasn't there. I think it's back on its feet now. Now, he's no longer in the ministry, unreconciled with his wife. His kids now are up and grown and got maybe one or two still at home. The relationship there is probably strained, I don't know. And so other, uh, I had to deal with that decision because he and I were friends. I, I mean, when I found out, I wanted to get, I tried to call him and call him and call him. Why? Because I want to pray for him and, and, and just let him know and find out what's going on. But anyway, I never did. But anyway, I'm trying to say to you that his decision affected hundreds and hundreds of people. I wonder how you would have responded to that if your pastor was to do that. How about this? Uh, many, many had to deal with that decision. His church staff, his own parents. How, how, would you, how do you think his own parents felt? His own in-laws, his own children, and other preachers. Most people do not know how to properly handle the decisions of others. Most people don't. They really don't. Experience has taught me on how to handle many things in people's life. I'm still learning. I haven't yet uh, 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 attained the, uh, what you might say, the ability or the know-how to, uh, in other words, because everything's always changing, but I have learned. I have learned. How did I do that? Well, experience has taught me one thing. Experience has taught me how to handle the the decisions of other people. Right? I I, I, I can't hardly do it. I could give you, I don't know, dozens and dozens of illustrations of, of, of people like King Saul. Brother Baker, you're, a, I, you're one of the best preachers I've ever heard. What a wonderful pastor you are. And on and on. And that same person decide, I'm just leaving. I'm just leaving. Why? Well, I don't like Brother Baker's decisions. Are you listening to me? That's heartbreaking to a preacher. Now, I'm, not, I'm talking about over the years, 42 years of pastoring. I've had it happen in my first church, my second church, it happened here. I had, to, I had to learn how to deal with people's decision-making. That affected me. Are you listening to me now? 
You had to learn something too, hadn't you? Some of you sitting right now, you could come up here and say, Preacher, I've learned some things too. Experience has taught me. And some of you sitting here, you've learned from experience too, hadn't you? So raise your hand up real high if you have. Okay, all right. Now watch this. Now consider our text we just read about David. The king said, I'm going to make you the, com the commander in chief of the army. You're going to live in the palace. You're the number one man besides me, David. I'm telling you what. And Jonathan, Jonathan I mean, it, here's David. I mean, he has got, he's got it made. Until, until, listen now, until they come home from battle and somehow or another they begin to sing a song and there's King Saul, there's David, there's the whole army and led by the women, they begin to sing a song that Saul has killed his thousands. Saul has killed his thousands. Oh, Saul has killed his thousands. And oh, Saul said, yeah, that's me. I didn't kill my thousands. They sing about Saul. Verse two. But David has killed his ten thousands. Oh, his ten thousands. And Saul said, what? I mean, so now... Saul has decided, I don't like that tune. I don't like that second verse. And he begins to eye David. The green-eyed monster of jealousy, he decided to do that. Decision-making. Can you imagine all around him, men that were loyal to David, now Saul says, I want him dead. Matter of fact, if you'll go back and read that, that Psalm 18 and Psalm 131, you'll see that David said, my, my closest friends turned on me. My own family, those I'd done good for, those I'd done good to, those that I had built, built up and gave money to, now they turned against me. Now watch this. Think about this now, about decision making of others. Adam had to make a decision when Eve sinned, didn't he? Ever thought about this? Had Adam not decided to do what Eve did, where would we be? Let me ask you a question. Who was the devil really after, Adam or Eve? He's after Adam. You see, Eve was under him. So if Adam had eaten first, she'd have ate because of obedience. So the devil had to get her to get him. And he decided, because he loved her, I'll do the same thing. He decided to do that and plunged all of humanity into sin and straight to hell. All because he decided to do it. I thought about this. How about when Joseph's brothers decided, listen, decided, here comes that dreamer. That smart addict little brother of ours telling folks we're going to bow down to him and he got that coat on that daddy gave him. I'm sick of his mouth. Playing his little harp, keeping a little sheep. And they decided, now's the time. We're going to kill him. We're going to put him to death. And when David gets there, they grab him. Now, we don't, you got, to, you got to try to visualize how they did this. But they decided, we're going to do away with you, buddy. I mean, uh, 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 Joseph, we're going to do away with you. And so they strip him down and throw him in the pit with the intentions of leaving him there, letting him die. And then, of course, they decided, we'll just ship him off with these Ishmaelites here to the land of Egypt. We'll never hear from him as a slave. They decided to do that, and Joseph had to live with their decision. You think he liked it? You think he, you think he resisted it? I, I don't think Joseph said, okay, okay, fellas, just whatever you want. No. I believe Joseph might have said, fellas, what are you doing, man? This is crazy. You can't do this, guys. I'm your own flesh and blood. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're sick of you, Joseph. Yeah, you've all the time you just, we'll see who bows down to somebody. We're going to, well, you'll die in that pit. I can see Joseph maybe saying, this is not right. Can you see it? Can you see them as they, as they sell him to the Ishmaelites and they head toward Egypt and his brothers head back home? David had, I mean, uh, Joseph had to live with their decision. Wasn't pretty, wouldn't do good, was it? How would you like to be, make that decision? And then notice in Joseph's life how other people's decision affected him. He had no sooner gotten Potiphar's house, rose to the top. You know why? He decided not to hold any grudges. 
He decided, listen, he decided in the worst of circumstances, as a slave, I am not going to let it keep me down. And God's hand was on Joseph, and he rose to the top in Potiphar's house. And then a wicked woman decided, I want him. I'm going to have that young man. And she allured him into her bedchambers, uh, uh, tried to tempt him to have sex with her. He fled that place, and she decided, I'll lie on him. And as a result of her decision, he's thrown in prison. In the prison, he decides, I'm going to still live for God. I'm going to still do right. And he rose to the top in prison. Need I say much more? Finally, where do we find Joseph? We finally find Joseph in the, in the king's palace, and now he's vice president, you might say. He has risen to the top. Why? Because he decided not to let other people's decisions ruin his life. And he decided that when the time came, he'd get his father, he'd get his brothers, he'd bring them all back. And when, it, when it's all said and done, Joseph, Joseph was the greatest one of all his brothers. And they did bow down to him. Are you listening to me? Other people's decisions. How about Joshua and Caleb? The spies go out and they come back and the ten, uh, ten spies say, it's a land with milk and honey, but we can't take it. It's giants over there. They decided, we can't take the land. God had already said it's yours. But these 10 spies said, we can't take it. They decided that. Joshua and Caleb decided, we can take it. And, and they're wrong and God's right. Let's go get it right now. But the people decided to listen to the majority. But watch that. These 10 guys have got a point here. We can't do that. And as a result of the whole of the nation deciding to follow the 12, I mean the 10 instead of the 2, for 40 years they wandered in the, in the desert and thousands upon thousands died. But Joshua and Caleb were rewarded for their decision. Hmm. Understand what I'm saying? How about David's decision with Bathsheba? A horrible decision. We find good decisions in David's in his early life. Now, now he's the king, and he decides one day, looks out there, and he sees this woman. He knows who she is. I mean, her husband's in his army, he, and he's a captain. David knows who the woman is. She's a beautiful woman. Fair to look upon, the Bible says. He sent for her. He made the decision to do that. You know the story. She came. They committed adultery. Could I say to you, sex outside of marriage is sin. Having sex with somebody else's wife or husband is still sin. It's wicked. David, is, and David knows he's doing wrong. Da listen, David decided, listen, to go against what he knew was right. He just, to go against what he knew was right and commit adultery with that woman. And then, to try to get it all out of the way, he orders for her husband to be put to death. He decided that. Now think about all the people that are involved. And as a result of David's wicked decision, his own family would suffer division the rest of his life. That was his punishment. You can sin if you want to, but God makes a decision you don't like sometimes. So David made that decision. I thought about Paul and Barnabas. Think about this now. Here's Paul and Barnabas. They are just like that. They're inseparable, best of friends. They're in Antioch, in the book of Acts. They're in the, in the town of Antioch. And they have now been ordained and commissioned. They're going to leave and go uh, to the Gentile world and carry the gospel and start some churches on their first missionary journey. So here, here comes young John Mark. He's the, uh, the human author of the book of Mark, John Mark. He decides, hey, Uncle, Uncle Barnabas, can I go with you? Well, let's see, Paul, what do you think? Yeah, he might be some help to us. So John Mark decides to go with them. So they strike out on the missionary journey. Where they get, we don't know, but somewhere along the way, John Mark quits. He decides to quit his decision. Now, 
Paul and Barnabas got to live with that decision. Well, they said, well, get on back home. Ain't no big deal. Go on back home. So John Mark comes back home. They can finish the journey. They come back from their journey. They reassemble. Paul and Barnabas, still best of friends. Are you listening? Still best of friends. They decide, let's return. Let's go back and see how they're doing. And so they decide, and so here comes John Mark. Uncle Barnabas, can I go? Brother Paul, can I go? Nope, can't go. Paul says, you're not going. You quit the first time. I'm not messing with a bunch of guys. I, I, you just ain't going to do it. Let me go. And, and Uncle Barnabas talked to Paul. So here's Paul and Barnabas, best of friends. Paul has decided he ain't going. Barnabas has decided he is going. Both of them got opposite decisions. And Paul and Barnabas, best of friends. And the Bible says that their dissension was severe. I mean, they got into it. I'm talking about a knockdown, drag out argument. Two of the greatest men in the Bible. The Bible says that Barnabas was full of the Holy Ghost. And Paul likewise. Here are two spirit filled, godly men arguing over one another's decision. All because John Mark decided, I'm coming home. Woo! We never hear of Barnabas anymore, do we? Does that mean that God didn't use him? Doesn't mean that at all. It means the focus changed in the Bible to Paul's journeys. Well, I could go on. You see, it's a learning process. Learning. You have to learn how to handle other people's decisions. You kids who are here, when your parents make bad decisions, you've got to learn how to handle that at a young age, okay? And parents, you've got to learn to deal with your children's decisions as they become adults. Now watch this now. Uh, it's a learning process. Now, first of all, why is it a learning process? Give me, watch this. Family. Decisions of family, your mom, your dad, your grandparents, your sons, your daughters, your, when somebody in your family makes a decision, and you have to deal with it. Huh? How about this? Your friends. When your friends make a decision, you may have to deal with it, good or bad. How about this? Your foe, your enemies. When your enemies make a decision, you got to deal with it. You got to learn to deal with it. When you, when you become the target, of the enemy, you got to learn to deal with it. How do you treat your enemy? How about your coworker, where you work? When they make a decision at work, sometimes you got to learn to live with their, uh, handle their decision. A coworker. How about a classmate at school for your students who are here? How, how about this? How about the, uh, the, uh, your, the, your teammates on the ball team? The coach makes a decision. You got to live, you got to learn how to handle that sometimes. How about the leader with the follower and the follower, the, you've got a supervisor above you or you've got folks who work under you. You're the leader and they're the follower. You've got to learn to handle other people's decisions. How about your neighbor? <laughs> You're the neighbor that decides to build a fence. You don't like the fence. Huh? Oh, yeah. I, I, I talked to a man years ago. He said, preacher, he said, man, my neighbor built a fence, on our, uh, divide our property, and it's the ugliest thing I ever laid my eyes on. I mean, it's ugly. That's ugly on his side. On the other side, it's pretty. And his neighbor was mad about it. He built that fence and made it ugly on my side. He said, I don't know what to do. I said, well, you can't tear it down because it's not on your property. No, I can't. I said, I don't know what to tell you to do. My thought was, build your fence. Yeah, Amen. Paint your side of it if he'll let you. Anyway, your family. Does their decision really involve you? Ask that question. When, you, when somebody else makes a decision, here's the question you ask. Does that, is that any of my business? You'll be surprised at people who are just caught up in somebody else's, somebody else's decision and it really it bugs them. Sometimes I want to say to this fella, why does that bother you? It just does. It don't even, bother, it don't even affect you. But it still bothers me. That's stupid. They're crazy. And it may be. It's none of your business. Why should you be bothered 
by somebody else's decision, it don't even faze you. It don't even faze you. Now, if those were my kids, I wouldn't have decided to do that. Well, good, they're not your kids. If that's my wife, I wouldn't decide to do that. It's not your wife, not your business. Here's what I'd have done if I didn't know. You can't do that. Now watch this. Now let me give you some. What are some of the do's and don'ts about other people's decisions? I'm going to go through them pretty quick now for time's sake. I say that, but I got a bunch of them here. This is going to help you if you pay attention. Sit up straight and wake yourself up. And learning how to handle other people's decisions. This could, this could save your relationship with people. This could help your nerves and your worry and your friends. First of all, don't press the issue. When other people make, make decisions that, that are uncomfortable to you or what or involve you, do not press the issue. Why, in other words, sometimes if you press the issue with their decision, they're... It, it could come to a breaking point. I don't have a pencil in my hand, but I just pretend this is a pencil, okay? And if, you, if you're not careful, you take that pencil and you're trying to write and you know, you're aggravated and you write, what's going to happen to that point? It's going to break. Why? Because of too much pressure, Okay? Listen, you've got to learn not to press the issue. If you do, it's like a pencil point. Either you're going to break or they're going to break, and if either one breaks, there's big trouble. You've got to learn to lighten up on the issue. I didn't say ignore it. I said lighten up. Don't press the issue. If you do, somebody's going to break. You are the person it involves. There is a break. Paul, pause and be patient. You may, you may be angry on the inside. You may be upset. But just pause. Be still and let God do something in your heart. I've learned from experience the breaking point. The breaking point. So don't press the issue. Number two, don't blame yourself. It's amazing to me how people who, who, whose other, people who make decisions affect you or I, and if you're not careful, you'll blame yourself for their decision. And you're not to blame at all. I'm telling you. Hey, this preacher's wife who was left, I mean, I called her, I spoke with her, and she said, where did I, where'd I go wrong? Where did I mess up at, preacher? I said, I don't live with you, I don't know. I said, but I'm going to ask you a question. I said, uh, if, you, if you had some faults in your life, it never should have led him to do, commit adultery. She's blaming herself. That's crazy. When somebody else makes a decision and it's wrong and out of line, they made it, don't blame yourself. I don't care if it's your own family or your best friend. Don't blame yourself. Huh? I mean, think about it. How about this? Number three. Listen now, whenever other folks make decisions and it affects you and it's not the right decision, do not do what you think is right. I preached on that last week. There's a way that seemeth right unto a man, okay, but the end thereof is the ways of death. There's a way that seemeth right. And so don't do what you think is right. Well, here's what I'm going to do. You see, if you say here's what I am going to do, it will not be the right decision. You don't press the issue, you, you wait, you trust God, and let God enable you, enable you to make the right decision, to do what is right. How about this? Do not be judgmental. Now, I know we all make judgments, don't we? But don't, let, don't become so judgmental that you become God. Well, if I was God, here's what I, I hope God gets them. Whew. Don't become judgmental. Sometimes folks will make decisions you don't like and you don't know all the details. Once you find them out, it might not be as bad as you think they are. Do not become, you see, when you become judgmental, listen, 
When you become judgmental, it affects your countenance. It affects your demeanor when you become judgmental. Here's another one. Don't close the door at first. Keep the door of communication open. Don't just slam the door. I'm through with you. I can't believe you decided to do that. And you slam the door. Now listen to me. I said at first. Don't close the door at first. Now watch now. There may come a time for closure. And when that time comes, when everything you try to do, I mean you try to deal with it, there may come a time, listen now, for closure and you just have to walk away. You don't walk away happy. You don't walk away rejoicing. You walk away and say, I don't know what else to do. And listen, some people mess their lives up by not walking away. And it ha there are people right now, somebody made a decision 25 years ago, and there are people still living with that thing, dragging that chain around right now. Well, 25 years ago, 20 years ago, 10 years ago, when they decided to do this, and, and you're still dragging that chain around. I say walk away from it. It'll help you. It'll encourage you. You'll be better off for it. How about this one here? Accept what has happened. Accept what has happened. And then along with that acceptance, accept the fact, watch now, that many times you can't fix it. That's the problem. People make decisions, and you won't try to fix it. And sometimes you can't. David couldn't fix his problem. He couldn't, he couldn't make King Saul like him again. He couldn't fix it. I mean, there's sometimes you just can't fix other people's decisions. I can't fix it. Sometimes your kids are going to, are going to do things, make decisions that, that you're your kids, and you're going to try to fix all their problems. You'll drive yourself nuts. Here's a, here's a son or a daughter that's 40, 50 years old, st still living like a 12-year-old, and you're still trying to fix them. It won't work. <laughs> you just got to say, my son's a lazy low-down dog. I can't, I can't make him work. I'm just going to walk away from him. Oh, but I love him. Didn't say you didn't love him. Just walk away from him. All right. Boy, he said, preach how much more you got to go. Uh, I'm looking for a stopping point. Uh, how about this? Only help when and where you can. When somebody makes a decision that affects you, only help when and where you can. I mean, there are, play, there are times you can't do, but when and where you can, that's where you offer help. How about this in here? Uh, learn from others. I covered that. Learn from others. You can learn how other folks have made decisions. Listen, get all the facts you can. I mean, you may, when they make a decision, find out, talk, sit down and talk. Why'd you do this? Why did you do this? I could give an illustration right now, but it'd take too long to give it to you. Of That happened years ago. Why did you do this? I, I don't know why. And, and get all the facts. And once you get all the facts together, then you can maybe come to, uh, you can help out. But you can't help out if you don't have all the facts. And so understand that. That'll help you to get through this thing. So do that. Uh, listen, to this. this is a good one right here. Learn to adapt. That's, I mentioned that in marriage. But in other people's decisions, you've got to learn to adapt. If you don't, you'll be a nervous wreck. Hey, I'm telling you, from, from, as a pastor, if, if, God had, if God had not taught me how to adapt in the ministry, I'd resign years ago. I still hear preachers say this. Well... Sunday, it's Monday, and I'm ready to resign. Well, what happened? Oh, man, I might as well preach the statues yesterday. I had 10 go to sleep. Choir sang off key. The offering's low. I ain't know what I'm doing here. Oh, yeah. Ready to resign on Monday. And I thought, my goodness. Listen, I, listen if you decide to go to sleep in church, go to sleep. I'll scream, holler at you, keep on preaching. Hope you'll come back tonight. If you decide not to give, I'm going to keep on preaching. 
If you decide not even say amen, I'm going to keep on preaching. Are you listening to me? I'm saying you have got to learn to, to do what is right and, and honor God. Boy, I, oh, so much here. Learn to adapt. I haven't learned to adapt. Now watch this. Listen. Oh, this is a good one here. Learning. Keep a good rein on your emotions. Now this, you want to highlight this in three different colors. Learn to keep a rein on your emotions when other people make a decision. Because your emotions will come through. You'll get angry. You'll get glad. You'll get happy. You'll get sad. Listen. Listen to this statement real good. You are never to live based on your emotions. Why are they so up and down? Uh, you, think, you don't think I can prove that? All right. You show me a husband. Go to work. Have a good day at work. Come home. Boy, I can't wait to get home. When was she going to have supper tonight? Mm. Comes in. Hi, honey. How's supper coming? What? What supper? You didn't bring nothing home? I'm tired. I've been busy all day fighting these bunch of young'uns. <laughs> She's still in her pajamas. <laughs> and he said, I'm sorry. Sorry, honey. That's emotions. Oh. You're talking about the fishes up here? Emotion. You've got to keep a rein on your emotions. Now, I didn't say a tight rein, did I? I said a rein. Yeah. Hush. Let me finish preaching this message. Because if you don't, you'll be up. David behaved himself wisely. He didn't let the promotion get the best of him. He was happy about it. But when the king was after his head, he still maintained his composure. Keep a rain. On. Does that mean you won't ever cry? Don't mean that at all. You may cry yourself to sleep a many a night. But you've got to come to a point in your life where you, you with the help of the Holy Ghost, learn not to let your emotions control you. You control them. I've learned from experience. Learn. Oh, boy. How about this? Ask God for discernment. Ask God for discernment. Lord, he made this decision. She did. I don't understand why God gave me discernment. And only he can give you that. Discernment. Ask God for direction for you and for the one that made the decision. God, direct me in this matter. How should I handle it? What should I say, Lord? Ask God for direction. Which way should I go? And you pray for their direction. How about this? Ask God to give you a forgiving and understanding spirit when other folks have decided to do something that, will, that may be against you or toward you or whatever. Ask God to give you. You have to ask God to give you a forgiving and understanding spirit. Mm. You know, Esther came to the rescue in one of Israel's darkest hours. All because her uncle Mordecai decided, Esther, you're the only hope. And Esther made a decision, I'll put my life on the line to save my nation. And she did, and God blessed her decision. All because of her uncle, Mord uh, uncle Mordecai. Other people's decisions. Oh, I'm almost through, almost. Now, I've got three last things I want to say. Please forgive me, but I need to, I want to get these. What can you do? What things can you do to enable you to stay with it when other folks have made wrong decisions that affect you? I said, what can you do when other people in your family, friends, neighbors, and co-workers at school, whoever it may be, what can you do to stay even kill? To stay even kill, to keep from sinking down or getting too big headed. Let me give it to you real quick. Number one. You better come apart to worship. Come apart to worship. Come to church. Come to church. Come apart to church. 
And let that Sunday school teacher teach you. Let that choir sing to you. Let the Spirit of God speak. Let the man of God preach to you. If you don't come apart to worship, then you will come apart. Hey, it, it's the dumbest thing. It is the absolute dumbest thing that a, a, a saved person could ever do when somebody else has made a decision that affects you severely is for you to quit church. That's crazy. That's what the devil wants you to do. The best thing you can do is come to church and worship with a broken heart or disturb. Hey, hey, your heart will be better if you come to church than if you stay at home. Come apart to worship. Because if you don't come apart to worship, you will come apart at home. There are people, listen to me, I tell, there are people sitting home right now, Joe Ben, who didn't do that. Things happen in their life, other people's decision, and they quit church, quit you, quit me, quit, quit their family, and they sit home now doing nothing for God. Absolutely nothing. You know why? Somebody else's decision affected them. They quit church. Hmm. So, come apart. Number two, commit to your duty. Commit to your responsibilities. Commit to it. For example, somebody makes a decision, it affects you at church, at work, at school, whatever. Hey, you still have responsibility. Commit yourself to your responsibilities. Watch this now. All right, Robbie, somebody can make a decision that could greatly affect you. You still got to go to work, haven't you? You still got to love that wife, haven't you? You still got, you got, in other words, you got to, that's your responsibility. Don't let their decision affect how you treat her or do your job. What's wrong with you today? Well, you don't believe what somebody said about me. And you take it out on you. Everybody, everybody. Commit to your duty or your responsibility. Stay with it, stay with it, stay with it, stay with it. Hey, your heart may be broken, your spirits may be, just go ahead and stay with it, stay with it, stay with it. Listen, there are people who go to work sick. I mean, they're sick, but they still go to work. Why? They want that money, they got bills to pay. They got responsibilities, so they go to work. Hey, when you're down in the dumps and down and out, come to church, it'll pay off. So commit to your duty. How about this, number three? Commit to do right. Just because they messed up, I'm not gonna mess up. It's because they made a wrong decision. I am not going to mess up. Wait, when Joshua and Caleb heard the report of the 10 spies, did it affect them? No. They said, let's go take them. Let's go take it right now. We can, we can conquer them. God said it's ours. No, we can't do it. I mean, you commit to do right, no matter what anybody else decides to do, you commit to do right. Hmm. That's where your convictions come in. And your spirituality comes in when you commit to do right. You'll never know peace if you don't learn how to deal with the decisions of others. You know why so many church members, so many Christians don't have any peace? They let the decisions of other people take their peace away. You're looking at one preacher right now, that right now, I can see it for right now, that has complete peace of God in his heart. But if I told you in the last five years the decisions people have made that I thought was crazy, affected me. He said, preacher, why are you even still preaching? Because I decided a long time ago, I'm not going to let anybody's decisions affect me in such a way. Are you listening? Ruth, I hope you don't mind me using you. You're an inspiration to me. Just one of the many here. When your husband walked out on you with those three kids, I was mad. I was, I was young in the ministry. I just come here. I don't know what it's like today. I don't have no grudge. But I was mad. Why? What man? I didn't call the man. I wanted to go find him, drag him down the street and tar and feather him and run him off. In the name of Jesus. <laughs> but watch this. His decision didn't keep her out of church. His decision to walk away Hey, she cried and she cried and she cried. And some of you have cried too over the years, over things. And she cried, but she kept coming to church. Over a period of time, those tears began to dry up. Why? She had responsibility for three kids. Preacher, 
I want my kids to go to a Christian school. I don't have the money. I said, Ruth, don't worry about that money. I went to some of the fellows. I said, hey, let's pay that tuition for her. We paid it. Are you listening? You've got to learn that other people's decisions, if you allow them, will drag you down. You'll lose your peace. You'll lose your peace. All you have on your mind, I can't believe my son did this. I can't believe my daughter did this. I can't believe my mama did this. I can't believe my husband. I, I, they did it. They did it. You can't change it. You tried to. You tried to help out. You need to, have, you need to trust the Lord. Listen, you'll never know peace if you don't deal with it, okay? Your decisions must be better than, than those around you. Learn to behave properly like David did. It'll help you. From the, from the book of the book of Acts all the way through the book of Revelation, except for 1 John. From the book of Acts all the way through the book of Revelation, except 1 John, you'll find, you'll find verses that deal with the peace of God in people's lives. Isn't that amazing? From the book of Acts all the way through the book of Revelation, except 1 John. All of them addressed peace of God, peace of God. You cannot fully have the peace of God if you let the other people's decisions drag you down. You won't have it. You'll be full of worry, fear, fatigue, huh, failure. You don't need to be that way. You can keep going for God. I'm through. Lord Jesus.